Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Scott Dresel, and thank you very much for the invitation. I'm here on behalf of uh, Comptor Scott Stringer, uh, who is very pleased to have the invitation to participate in this discussion uh, and sends his greetings to, to all of you tonight. Uh, we think it's an incredibly timely and pressing issue. Uh, so really kudos to everybody to be actively engaged in uh, figuring out the, you know, the appropriate solutions here. Uh, in the short amount of time that we have tonight, uh, I want to cover three things. Uh, cover a little bit about who we are. Uh, I'm sure folks know the city pension plans, but a, a few details. Uh, be clear about our position about climate risk, uh, and then discuss what we're doing about it, right? So by way of background, the New York City Comptor Scott Stringer is the trustee to four of the five New York City pension plans and the investment advisor and custodian to all five of the plans, uh, along with his other trustees on each of those five plans. So each of the five city pension plans has their own uh, board of trustees, uh, and they govern about 160 some uh, assets worth of management uh, to secure the retirement future of 700,000 active and retired uh, city employees, firefighters, teachers, uh, uh, police officers, Board of Education, a whole, a whole range of city employees. So, as pension funds, we're inherently long-term investors, right? As long as there are police officers in the city of New York, as long as there are teachers in the city of New York, uh, we're going to have responsibility for paying out liabilities for many generations to come. So as such, we have a very long time horizon on our investment returns. Uh, and we have to recognize that, right? That includes actively monitoring the portfolio for a host of risks to those investment returns. Uh, the comptroller spoke last year at the United Nations Investor Summit on Climate Risk, however, and was unequivocal that he knows of no other greater risk, of dual threat that is, to both the city of New York and the five pension funds than climate risk. He's been clear on, on that position. The city of New York may have the lowest per capita greenhouse gas emissions of any large city in the US, uh, but we, we are among the most vulnerable to climate risk. Uh, in 2013, I'm sure a lot of folks here are familiar, uh, the World Bank uh, and the OECD put out a study uh, that described 136 of the largest coastal cities in the world uh, and found that only two cities face greater risk to climate change than the city of New York. Does anybody know, want to wager a guess? Miami, yep. Guangzhou in China. Uh, significant damage, potential damage from climate risk. Um, but that said, you know, the city of New York, these risks are not theoretical uh, or abstract or even remote, right? For the eight plus million residents of the city of New York uh, and who witnessed the devastation of Hurricane Sandy, uh, we, we know that, uh, that risk very poignantly. The city has 520 miles of coastline and from the storm surge during Sandy, over 62,000 homes were damaged, more than 23,000 uh, city businesses were affected, employing over 245,000 workers, uh, and even the New York Stock Exchange, right? The world's largest stock exchange by market cap was closed for two days. And I think everybody in this room can appreciate the symbolic symbolism of the sandbags that were piled up in front of the, store, uh, of the stock exchange to ward off that storm surge. That's what we're facing, right? So climate risk is real, climate risk is now, and we have to act now. Uh, as long-term investors, you know, it, I think it's our view that we need to be acting and not necessarily retreating from that challenge. Uh, given what's at stake, therefore, the New York City funds have uh, opted to be among the most active to actively engage the companies in our portfolio to monitor for long-term risks uh, uh, due to climate change. That's involved working with our colleagues at Ceres, uh, and the Investor Network on Climate Risk. The Comptroller serves on the board of the Investor Network on Climate Risk. Uh, it includes working with REED and the Carbon Tracker Initiative. Uh, our funds actively support uh, and engage companies to ask them to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions 
uh, to set objectives and goals, to disclose those objectives and goals. Uh, we've also engaged companies outside of the energy companies saying, look, you need to be more energy efficient. Not only does it make sense for our planet, but it makes sense as a business proposition. Uh, it's going to reduce your operating costs if you uh, make these buildings in your REIT uh, or these buildings in your apartments uh, more energy efficient. It's going to save us money. That's a win-win for us. It makes sense. Uh, but the problem is, and as we've been talking about tonight, the energy companies in particular are moving way too slowly. You know, we, we know it. Uh, so what do we do about it, right? Divestment, of, of course, is part of the debate. And in our view, I think the divestment debate uh, has tapped into an incredible energy and dynamism on college campuses and endowments uh, in communities uh, across the country and the world. Um, it's also helped elevate this critical issue uh, to a real policy issue and hopefully prompting uh, a more robust and assertive uh, public policy position. Um, but for us, the risk of climate change is not just about the energy companies in our portfolio. We're diversified uh, investors. We hold over 6,000 companies. Uh, so addressing climate change from the supply side alone doesn't necessarily mean that we're, ch we're changing anything on the demand side, right? Among those thousands of companies, we also have airlines, other transportation companies, manufacturers of plastic and others that are using these fuels. What's the best way to actually have uh, a real impact? And not just you know, an impact eventually, but an, an impact now. Let's flip the, the equation a little bit. Uh, we can talk about possibly you know, divesting uh, city funds, but what power uh, is it to these, a variety of the energy companies without the city of New York? I can tell you uh, there, there, there's a variety of data available on the website, uh, but at each of the major uh, oil companies in the U.S., the, the city pension plans in New York, the fourth largest pension plan system in the, in the country, uh, our total with $160 billion, a lot of money, uh, our total position in those companies is not greater than a quarter of 1% uh, of any of those companies. Uh, less than a quarter of 1%. So that's a question, right? If we pull out what happens today, Today, the, the value of those companies is still significant. Somebody else buys the, those shares right away. Uh, we, we're, we're here tonight, we're having the discussion and debate, uh, but our question is, how can we have the most impact now? Uh, the risk is real, the threat is now, we're seeing it. We need to change that curve at these companies. Uh, so we believe uh, that with only a quarter of a percent of ownership at these companies, we can have an impact. And in fact, we have. We've had tremendous impact. As owners of the companies, we need to push the companies to change their business strategies. I think Reed laid it out very eloquently uh, that many of the executives, many of the companies, are looking to serve short-term profitability by drilling now. As long-term investors, that's at the risk of our long-term returns, and there's external, uh, ex negative externalities in the portfolio that taking those carbons out of, uh, out of the ground is gonna have an impact on the rest of our economy and our society. So what we need to do is elevate our discussion to the boardroom. The executives have the wrong incentives, but the board directors are our representatives as shareholders, as, as investors. Uh, and to do that, we need the right mix of directors who have a long-term vision, who understand the risks are very real and very present. So what the Comptor has done in less than the last, half, last, last year is launched an initiative called the Boardroom Accountability Project. Uh, in November of last year, the Comptor Scott Stringer, along with the five New York City pension plans and all their trustees, announced that we would be filing 75 share owner resolutions that we have the right to do as share owners uh, that demands that the companies allow us as share owners to directly nominate candidates to the board of directors uh, who would serve our interests as long-term share owners. Specifically, uh, if you own 3% of the company's shares uh, and you've held them for a long amount of time, uh, you can nominate up to a quarter 
of the boards of directors. As Reed said, we need climate competent directors in these boardrooms. We also have other risks in our portfolio. So we also filed resolutions at companies where executive comp is, is out of whack. Uh, we filed at, at companies that uh, have no women on their boards uh, and tell us that they can't find women. We think that's bogus. Uh, if you can't find them, let us propose uh, uh, directors for the board. The problem with board, too many boards in corporate America today is that they nominate their, their own people uh, to the boards and investors have the option of either saying yes or no. If you say no, very little happens. So what we want is access. It's essentially called proxy access. What's the impact? You know, where, where are we? We've had, we've had 10 months. Uh, what, you know, what's happened at, uh, at these companies in the first year? Uh, 33 of those uh, 75 companies were our most carbon intensive companies. Uh, you know, to the point of the discussion tonight, uh, we are monitoring what are the most carbon intensive companies. And thank you to Reed and the Carbon, uh, carbon Tracker Initiative. Uh, we were able to identify and uh, verify uh, those companies. At 75% of those companies, the resolution either passed or the company agreed to implement the provision before it went to a vote. So share owners vote on the resolution uh, and once it passes, the board is now in the place uh, to have to respond. So what's happening is 75% of the most carbon intensive companies in our portfolio, and if they're in our portfolio, they're in a lot of funds portfolios, uh, are now grappling with how to implement uh, a change to their corporate policies that would let investors like us nominate directors directly to the proxy for other shareholders to vote on. These are companies that perhaps you've heard of, right? Chevron, Occidental, Hess, Duke Energy, Marathon Oil, ConocoPhillips, list goes, goes on and on. At other companies, we fell just short. For me personally, I was disappointed to see that at Exxon, uh, the resolution got 49.4% of the vote, just short. Uh, if you include the companies that fell just short, we actually uh, got over 90% of the resolutions uh, got close to 50% or above. Uh, so broad investor support. Uh, uh, for the change. So at Exxon, we're going to keep going. And we know that Exxon knows about half of their investors want this provision. Uh, and we know that Exxon's already responding. They pulled out of ALEC uh, last week. And that's with a lot of share owner engagement uh, that never reached uh, near majority support on, on share owner resolutions. Uh, but we expect that by virtue of its existence, uh, provisions that let long-term owners put forward our own candidates to the board will make each, every board want to be more responsive to us. We've got tremendous work uh, before us. We need to actively follow up to make sure that those policies are meaningful, that they're legitimate, uh, that, that companies don't you know, play around the edges and uh, with provisions that would thwart our ability to actually use the mechanism. Uh, we need to actively engage those boards around long-term strategies for a low carbon future. Uh, and we need to work with a variety of groups to put forward uh, more viable uh, nominees when, when we see that, when we see the need. Um, I think most critically for us as significant long-term investors is we need bold and engaged leadership on these issues, on these issues to help uh, force the companies to change their business strat strategies and the, tra the trajectory that they're, that they're currently on. So, I, I want to reiterate that you know we think this is a key discussion. Uh, you know we welcome uh, all of the active work around divestment. Uh, we agree that this is going to take a village, uh, as Senator Kruger said. Uh, it's going to take a variety of strategies to get there. Uh, we feel that right now, if we were to pull out, you know, game over. Uh, we no longer have influence uh, over these companies. Uh, but as we regularly monitor our exposure to the risk, uh, we're choosing to act now, uh, and we're deliberating on what the best way is to have a meaningful impact uh, right at this moment. And I'm pleased to say that uh, we're winning. Uh, your city funds are winning, uh, and we welcome your support, and we, uh, we would uh, 
you know, welcome the discussion tonight. So thank you.